Thank you very much. So, to the Stephen Paget Lecture. The Stephen Paget Memorial Lecture celebrates the life of Stephen Paget, who passionately believed that a greater understanding of physiology would lead to better medical advances. He was the founder of the Research Defence Society, which later became Understanding Animal Research. This year, we're delighted to celebrate the 84th Paget Lecture, adding Professor Claire Stanford to our long and eminent list of lecturers. Claire is Professor of Translational Neuropharmacology at UCL. She's an honorary fellow and a former trustee of the British Pharmacological Society. She's a past president of both LASA and the British Association for Psychopharmacology and a former member of the Council of the University of London. Although now semi-retired, Claire remains active in pharmacology and has editorial roles on several journals and is currently a member of the Animals in Science Committee and a LASA trustee. She's been a long supporter of UAR, most recently being involved in the development of, forced, of a forced swim test fact sheet and a member of the Openness Awards Judging Committee, as you've just seen. So I'm delighted to be able to introduce her to give her lecture a year late, uh, Tortoises, Hares and Other Animals on the Pathway to Antidepression, Claire. Thank you, Jeremy. It's a enormous honour to give this lecture. I can't imagine what I've done deserve to be added to the list. I'm mystified, but thank you. Um, when I've um, talked about my research in the past, and sometimes I've given the lecture um, the title, um, Keep Calm and Carry On, and I think uh, you'll understand why uh, when I tell you uh, about um, my research in this lecture. Um, but at least it's evidence that, uh, in my view, there's no such thing as a negative finding. Um, whether it's negative or positive or not depends on what you do next. And coming from UCL, of course, I have to mention Jeremy Bentham, who thought that it'd be a good idea to have universities that were secular and uh, might even educate women. Um, but what he's mostly known for, of course, is for considering animal suffering and for suggesting that they should have some sort of legal protection, and that led the path to the Cruelty to Animals Act, which was morphed into ASPA over 100 years later. Um, and I must admit that Jeremy Bentham still rouses controversy because the, on the left, you see him in his splendid Victorian cabinet, and college recently gave him a, a, a makeover, um, which some staff don't actually think is a great idea. <laughs> Um, but my story starts with Walter Cannon, uh, beginning of the uh, 20th century, um, who uh, identified the sympathoadrenal response, the so-called flight or fight response. Um, and he was collecting plasma samples from cats, which he described as being within earshot of noisy, energetic little dogs. I mean, you can imagine the scenario, a brave man indeed. Um, but he found something in the plasma. In fact, it turned out to be two somethings. It was identified much later as adrenaline and noradrenaline. But he found a neuroactive compound which he thought was in, released in response to the psychological stimulus of hearing these yappy dogs, um, but also physical stimuli as well. And moreover, he thought this neuroactive compound in the plasma was in some way associated with the emotional response of the animals, and moreover, that the individual differences in the emotional response was somehow coded um, by this chemical. Um, and really, that summarizes this whole lecture, the challenge of finding a causal link between neurobiology and pharmacology and mood and behavior. Well, um, to start, I have to give you a brief tutorial on um, the life cycle of noradrenaline, which is one of the things that um, Cannon was measuring. Noradrenaline is synthesized from dietary tyrosine, which is taken up into nerve terminals, um, and the rate-limiting step in that pathway is the enzyme tyrosine hydroxylase. Um, Tyrosine is an intermediate product is dopamine, and dopamine is taken into those storage vesicles um, um, where uh, the final step in the pathway takes place. 
Now, these storage vesicles fuse with the neuronal membrane when the neuron is excited and extrude their contents into the synaptic cleft. And from there, the noradrenaline, some of it diffuses away in the overflow, can reach the plasma or other target cells that are distant. But some of it is taken up on protein transporters, and they are one target for antidepressant drugs. And some of the noradrenaline, which is taken back into the nerve terminals, is metabolized by an enzyme called monoamine oxidase, which is also a target for antidepressant drugs. And in this figure, I've illustrated two receptors for noradrenaline. There are lots of them, about 11 in all. Um, but the alpha-2 adrenoceptors are interesting because they operate a feedback inhibition process. And they, when they're excited by extracellular noradrenaline, they tend to dampen down release of transmitter. And beta adrenoceptors on target cells are responsible for initiating um, the response overall. Now, this process takes place in both sympathetic nerve terminals, but also a huge amount of noradrenaline is released from the adrenal glands. And in fact, the adrenal gland was initially the model to study because in Cannon's day, the assays for noradrenaline were very, very insensitive. It was all done by bioassays. And so to get enough noradrenaline to measure, you had to use adrenal glands, bovine adrenal glands, um, and try and work out what was going on. And that was justified because adrenal glands really are, the adrenal medulla really is like a very big sympathetic nerve terminal, and they're derived from the same embryonic tissue. And all the conclusions from those studies have more or less been borne out when they've been um, scaled up for, um, for um, sympathetic nerve terminals. Now, I have to slip this in, but when it was first realized that the compounds in the plasma were adrenaline and noradrenaline, and their molecule was characterized, Michel Paget realized that they had a potential to, um, uh, to be fluorescent. Uh, I don't think it's any relation, but it was a brilliant um, uh, observation because it led to the development of an assay which relied on precisely that process, converting noradrenaline into a fluorophore, which could be measured by this spectrophorimeter. And I use this every day of my PhD life. Um, and I was aware of, the, personally, of the aging process when, as a postdoc, and I did a brief stint at NIH, I actually saw this piece of kit in their museum. <laughs> um, but the, the early studies, um, was when I was working with Marianne Valence um, in, in Oxford, I did my defil with her and postdoc for a while, um, and we were trying to follow up on Cannon's work on the role of noradrenaline in the stress response using this really super new assay. But laboratories at the time were using stresses like um, long-term immobilization, where animals really were pinned to the bench. They couldn't move at all, um, or quite intense foot shocks, tail shocks. And we wanted to use naturalistic stresses. So we started off with cold stress at 4 degrees C, with two rats in a cage which just popped into the cold room for about six hours. So they could cuddle up in the cage, but the ambient temperature is cold. And as you can see, the noradrenaline um, that appeared in the plasma, um, we recorded at hourly intervals, uh, progressed to a peak and then dropped off. And that wasn't because the nerve terminals were running out of noradrenaline, because when the animals were also treated with dizipramine, which is a blocker of that transporter, it blocks reuptake of noradrenaline, and so the clearance is delayed. The overall pattern is very similar, it's just plasma concentrations were higher. And we also looked at brief swim stress. These were one minute swim stress about um, every half hour for um, six episodes. And the general pattern was just the same. But the reason I'm showing you this is because I want you to note the um, concentrations on the left-hand side. Because this shows quite clearly that the plasma concentrations during the swim stress are pretty much the same as plasma concentrations during cold stress. And it's not much warmer outside um, than 4 degrees C at the moment. 
So swim stress is actually not much more stressful than a feral rat would experience while foraging on a typical December um, evening. But while this was um, going on, there was um, a very influential hypothesis. In fact, it still is. It's still in all the textbooks, um, which was devised by um, Joseph Schilkraut, who was an American psychiatrist. And he noted two things about patients he was seeing. One group of patients were being treated with a drug called resipine. And what resipine does is it stops those storage vesicles um, from containing their transmitter store. So uh, resipine essentially strips noradrenergic neurons of their supply of neurotransmitter. And Schilkra noticed that a proportion of those patients, it was only about 15%, uh, so it's not um, simply re the loss of transmitter, it's transmitter loss plus something else, but um, he noticed that about 15% of those patients uh, experienced suicidal um, depression. And he surmised that perhaps depression could be caused by a deficit in noradrenergic transmission. And that theory caught on big time, um, and it was revised later on to include serotonin, um, and so it became known as the monoamine theory of depression because they're both monoamines. Now, that theory is now deprecated. There's never been any evidence uh, found to support it, except perhaps under extreme experimental conditions. But in terms of depressed patients, that theory is now dead in the water. But another observation of Schildkraut's was patients were being given ipronizid to treat tuberculosis. Um, it still is used to treat tuberculosis. Um, but for a completely different reason, it blocks monoamine oxidase, which if you remember is that enzyme which metabolizes noradrenaline. And a side effect of that, um, um, the side effect it, it pronounced was to induce euphoria. In fact, it was regarded as um, an unwanted side effect because if you can imagine, you've got these terribly sick tuberculous patients um, with some, um, some of them bouncing around you know, with their euphoria generally making a nuisance of themselves. Um, but Chilcrat realised that if it made... Um, euthymic patients, euphoric. Perhaps it would cheer up depressed patients, and they tried that, and it worked. And this became the very first antidepressant drug. Before that, all they had was amphetamine, which was used for 30 years to treat depression, but whereas amphetamine gets you going, it would get them out of bed, um, it doesn't cheer you up. So this was a really um, huge step in the field. Um, and Laird Schilkraut suggests that drugs uh, that boost uh, noradrenaline but later change the monoamine transmission um, could relieve depression. And that theory is alive and kicking because um, until ketamine came along very recently, every single antidepressant drug in the clinic augments monoamine transmission. <coughs> now, Schilkraut's problem, um, and of that era, was that the assays weren't sensitive enough to measure noradrenaline function in the brain. In fact, um, although noradrenaline was known to be in the brain, the prevailing view was that it was simply there to regulate uh, the cerebral vasculature. Martin Falk suggested it might have something to do with what the brain does and you regulate movements and mood and cognition and so forth, but it was never really an idea that caught on. And evidence of that is um, Les Iverson, who um, was, um, he did an enormous amount of important work on noradrenaline, and this book is basically his PhD thesis, which was published in 1967. And Les Iverson also went on to do important work on neurokinin receptors, which I'm going to be talking about later. Um, but in this book, uh, the very last chapter is about um, noradrenaline in the central nervous system. Uh, and it's very thin compared with the rest of the, the book. And it's got this wonderful quote that in recent years, the evidence that noradrenaline and dopamine um, may act as neurotransmitters 
in the central nervous system has become progressively more convincing. So Les Iverson is really you know, being very cautious there. Um, but three things happened to change all that. One was that Paul Greengard realised that cyclic AMP was a second messenger um, for lots of receptors, but in particular for beta adrenoreceptors in the brain. And another one was the development of radioligin binding, where drugs that bind to receptors are given a radioactive tag, and you can use that tag, therefore, to measure the density, literally count the receptors in tissues. And both these um, groups reported that after chronic administration of antidepressant drugs, there is a down-regulation of cyclic AMP in the cerebral cortex in the brain, um, and also Uprit Chardinena um, found a reduction in the density of beta adrenoceps in the brain. Now, actually, that all turned out to be a bit of a red herring, but at the time, it was hugely important because it made people realise that until then, all they'd done was study the acute effects of antidepressant drugs, which would tell you a lot about the you know, cellular targets and so forth. But in terms of how can they be antidepressants, the chronic administration bit was vital because depressives need chronic treatment with antidepressants before the treatment works. In a lot of patients, it still doesn't work. About a third of them um, are treatment resistant. But most patients need weeks, sometimes months, for their therapy to um, take effect. So these groups realise that it's that long-term treatment that we really need to be exploring. Um, well, um, we were doing our share of grinding and binding, as it's called, because although they'd found down-regulation of beta receptors in the cortex, it wasn't at all clear what was happening to other adrenoceptors, if anything, um, and whether uh, the down-regulation extended to other brain regions. Um, and this graph um, on the left sketch our plot, the shift to the left shows that there was actually a down-regulation of beta receptors in the cortex. That agreed with um, Pritchard and Enner, but nothing happened to alpha-2 adrenoceptors, and actually nothing happened to other re uh, receptors in other brain regions. But what attracted our attention was we thought there was something odd going on with the controls, and so we set, which were being given a saline injection. So we set up an experiment to look at that, where um, a group of animals, some of which were simply handled for a minute, once a day, for 14 days, um, and another um, a batch, uh, not another batch, but other animals in that group uh, were given a handling session plus a saline injection, which is regarded as a perfectly standard control procedure um, to any pharmacologist. And sure enough, what we found was that the activity of tyrosine hydroxylase increased quite dramatically, over 60%. Now, that told us that the neurons are synthesizing more noradrenaline, presumably so that they can maintain the store to keep up an increased release rate. In other words, handling, particularly with a saline injection, were really quite stressful to these animals. And then the density of alpha-2 and beta adrenoceptors, that went down. Um, and this is consistent with the down-regulation that you Pritchard and Enna had seen with antidepressants. When you soak receptors in with the neurotransmitter, they internalize the so-called down-regulation so that the target cells can try to maintain some sort of homeostasis. So this was telling us even the handling was stressful and was producing changes which actually were well on the way in terms of magnitude um, to those seen with antidepressant drugs. Now, I have to say we had immense trouble getting this work published. I wish I'd kept some of the referees' comments because some of them were almost actionable, actually. Um, but um, we found a home for it eventually with neuroscience letters, which I think still only has an impact factor of about one. But there we go. Um, but now, of course, we know that handling is stressful to animals, um, and it not only causes biochemical changes in the brain, um, but it affects their behavior, and it affects experimental outcome. 
And it's not just any old handling, it's how you handle them can make a difference as well. Um, and that is a very important finding, and well done Jane Hurst for doing the right experiments that convinced everyone. Well, the third development that made the difference was that of microdialysis. Um, and together with um, the development of HPLC, high pressure liquid chromatography, with very sensitive detection techniques like electrochemical detection, because noradrenaline is also electroactive. And this meant that you can implant a microdialysis probe in selected brain regions, and the noradrenaline, which um, diffuses away from the nerve terminal, some of it will find its way to the dialysis membrane at the end of this probe. And the probe is perfused with artificial CSF, so the solute that um, penetrates the probe is flushed away, and you can measure noradrenaline in aliquots um, using electrochemical detection. Now, microdialysis does have a yuck factor attached to it because you do have the probe penetrating uh, above the skull. But bear in mind that the diameter of the probe, 250 microns, is not much bigger than the diameter of electrodes, which are now being implanted routinely in patients for treatment of Parkinson's disease um, and also, in some cases, extreme depression. Um, also, the brain, of course, has no pain fibres. Um, and in fact, you know, some surgical procedures are done without anaesthetic to make sure the surgeon's chopping out the right bit. Um, and the only um, dis um, bit of the procedure which would cause physical discomfort is creating a small burr hole in the skull so that you can insert the dialysis probe into the chosen brain region. Now, that procedure, trepanation, has been around for centuries. This is um, Hieronymus Bosch. Used to do it routinely um, to, they believed it, it released sort of evil spirits and influences. And I suppose this was a medieval way of treating antisocial behaviour. Um, but it still happens today. Um, here is Amanda Fielding. She did her own. She drilled a um, hole in her own head. Um, and she thought it made her just feel absolutely wonderful and in fact she stood as a candidate for member of parliament on the ticket that she thought trepanation ought to be available on the NHS and recently um, she um, had a, a, another um, uh, trepanation procedure because she was a bit concerned that the first one had healed over so using microdialysis we're able to sample changes in extracellular noradrenaline in selected brain regions. And um, with Jeff Daly, who's now um, in, at Cambridge, uh, we went back to our let's use naturalistic, um, non-noxious dressers to see um, what we can um, measure in the cortex. Um, and um, so the probes implanted in the cortex, and you see that during the day, noradrenaline concentration um, in the extracellular fluid is an index of release, if you like, um, is, is fairly stable. But when you pick the animals up, you get quite a sharp peak, and it takes a while to dissipate. And then if you pick the animals up and transfer them to a novel cage, the peak is even more prominent um, and takes longer to dissipate. If that novel cage is brightly lit, then the responses last much longer, as does, it does um, if the novel cage includes um, a strange rat. So this told us that um, the noradrenergic neurons in the brain are exquisitely sensitive to changes in their environment, um, as well as um, stress of handling and so forth. Light intensity um, is, is quite important, and of course we, of course we know this. Um, and it, it underpins the principle now that all animals should have an enriched environment in order to um, improve their welfare. But it, it, just to show how, how laboratory animal science really has progressed in the last 20 years, when the proposal for a rich environment um, was first mooted and the popular press got a hold of it, um, this photo caption won the 
prize um, in the Times um, that, that week. The, the press were treating it actually with some derision, which was quite distressing. Okay, so um, an opportunity to look at a brand new antidepressant underdevelopment um, came to light, um, and that was Cybutramine, which has been developed by Boots Company. Um, and um, I collaborated with um, David Heal, his photograph is there, um, whom I'd known from Oxford days. And Cybutramine is a noradrenaline and serotonin reuptake inhibitor, um, and we we thought it's this new drug, let's see if it's like um, the others. But actually, that didn't last very long because cybutramine stopped being an antidepressant and started being an anti-obesity agent. And the reason for that was that as in phase three clinical trials, it worked in the majority of clinical trials, but not all of them. And because it's a monoamine uptake inhibitor, and there are already dozens of those in the clinic, some of them have lost their patent protection already, and so are, are, are cheap as chips. Cybutramine was never going to be a blockbuster antidepressant. But what they noticed was patients in clinical trials all lost weight. So they repositioned it as an anti-obesity agent. Um, and actually, Boots was strongly criticized for fabricating an obesity epidemic simply so that they could flog their drug. Um, <laughs> And this was quite a while ago. You know, the, the media are very cynical. Um, but actually, to get it licensed as an anti-obesity agent, um, the regulatory authorities were really concerned to ensure that it's not going to be addictive. Because, of course, the prototypical anti-obesity agent was amphetamine. And if cybutamine looked anything like amphetamine, it was dead as far as um, clinical approval goes, but actually it didn't look anything like amphetamine. With amphetamine you can see uh, it's a releasing agent for neuroadrenaline and dopamine and there's a very fast um, surge of release uh, which dissipates away progressively whereas cybutramine because it's an uptake inhibitor you get a progressive accumulation of transmitter in the cleft um, in response to spontaneous release of transmitter. Well, um, the FDA were happy with that, so, um, and a lot of other evidence too, I hope to say, um, but they licensed it, um, and it, um, if for a long time, it was the only centrally acting anti pc agent in the clinic. Um, so, having um, failed to uh, manage to look at antidepressant effects of cybutramine, another opportunity came to light, um, and that uh, relied on the substance P, preferring receptor, the so-called neurokinin 1 receptor. Now, substance P was first discovered by Gadden, who was um, an early head of department of pharmacology at UCL. Um, and it was, amongst other things, it was found in sensory afferent neurons and thought to have a key role in pain. Um, and after identifying the receptor, uh, a small molecule, because substance P is quite a uh, well, it's a smallish peptide, but it's a peptide, so it's pharmacologically very difficult. Um, but they managed to develop an NK1 receptor antagonist, which is a small scaffold which will bind to the receptor and block um, substance P effects at that receptor. And it went into clinical trials as an, um, uh, as an analgesic antineoceptive agent, uh, but that didn't work out very well. Um, they, um, and it's quite disappointing. In fact, what substance P appears to do is regulate stress-induced analgesia. You know, during intense stress, the sense of pain is blunted, and substance P seems to be important for that. So it wasn't the sort of analgesia that they were looking for. Um, but um, obviously doing broad brush investigation of uh, what these compounds are doing, what they noticed was that uh, the uh, NK1 antagonist uh, it showed up as a positive result in the force swim test. And I'm going to be talking about the force swim test again later. But briefly, this involves uh, placing um, a rat or a mouse in a container of water from which they can't escape. And they swim around for a while, but then develop an immobile posture with their noses above the water. They don't drown because they float 
um, spontaneously. Um, but the factor with antidepressants is that all of them increase the latency of animals to develop this immobility um, and is called the poor salt swim test. And here you can see fluoxetine, which is Prozac, uh, that increased immobility, and so did this NK1 receptor antagonist, uh, which was under development. So it looked as though it could be a promising antidepressant. Then um, Carmen de Felipe, working in Steve Hunt's group in Cambridge, developed the NK1 receptor knockout mouse, um, and they tested that in the four stream test, and you can see that uh, that, that too delays uh, immobility. Um, and if you look at the, what, compare the y-axis on these two graphs, you can see that the NK1 receptor mouse is really motoring um, in this test. It takes a long while to calm down. But the knockout mouse, um, it, it's not actually a knockout um, because the receptor is still there, but they dropped a cassette into, into the gene for the receptor so um, it doesn't work anymore. Um, so that if you use immunofluorescence, you can't see it in the brain or in the spinal cord or on Western blunts. It's just functionally um, ablated. Well, we used our microdialysis in um, those mice to see if they, their neurochemistry fitted with what we know about antidepressants. And it looked quite good. Uh, we started off using anaesthetized mice because not having done microdialysis in mice before, we wanted to make sure that our procedures were absolutely up to scratch before we attempted freely moving animals. And so both these are in anaesthetized animals. And you can see that the um, noradrenaline efflux in the knockout mice is much higher than in the wild types. And if you give the animals a dose of an antidepressant, like desmethylamipramine, the noradrenaline transporter uptaker inhibitor, then you get the same response, but it's, everything is just um, raised, um, raised to a higher concentration. In this experiment on the right, we were looking at the effects of blocking alpha-2 receptors. Now, blocking those receptors should increase noradrenaline release because those receptors, you'll have lost the feedback inhibitory process for noradrenaline release. And sure enough, in the wild types, noradrenaline efflux went up. Um, but interestingly, uh, nothing happened in the knockouts. And we had a story, uh, we had a, um, a, a follow-up of that, but um, it was quite interesting. But when we went into freely moving animals, it, it all went pear-shaped, really, because uh, there wasn't any difference in noradrenaline efflux in awake animals. And to see whether that was anything to do with the anaesthetic, we did an experiment starting off in awake animals and then taking them down under... This, you can see when... This, this is in the days when halothane was, was the um, volatile anaesthetic to use. Um, and you can see that as the animals undergo anaesthesia, then the difference in the noradrenaline efflux um, develops. And we think that that difference is actually created by an interaction between the anaesthetic and alpha-2 adrenoceptors. And this is a synergism which is exploited in veterinary practice now um, that for short surgical procedures, you give a dose of an alpha-2 agonist like metatomidine because it greatly reduces the amount of volatile anaesthetic you need to use. So the animals wake up much more quickly um, and everything goes very well. But that was a bit of a blow, that we're expecting um, increased noradrenaline efflux and it didn't show up in vivo. Um, and another disappointment was that when the probe was implanted in the striatum, uh, the knockouts had very, very much less noradrenaline, um, dopamine, sorry, dopamine um, release in the striatum than the wild types. Now, um, dopamine is the reward transmitter. Dopamine is what makes us think it's worth getting out of bed in the morning. So animals that have got um, impaired dopamine release in the brain are not going to be antidepressed. Uh, so we couldn't really understand how this could possibly be um, a mouse 
behaving as though it was an antidepressant mouse. But what we had noticed was that they were really hyperactive. Um, strangely, that, had a, no, you know, that hadn't been noted before. Um, and to record that, we placed the animals in the dark zone of a light-dark exploration box for an hour and a half, because the experiments with Jeff Daly showed us that it takes them at least that time to get the noradrenaline released back down to normal after picking them up and putting them in the enclosure. And after that time, they're allowed to freely explore um, both zones, and we recorded their activity. And you can see that the knockouts are really very busy indeed. Um, just to make sure, we teamed up with Andy Ramage and Adrian Hobbs. From Andy's at UCL, Adrian's now at Queen Mary. And they did some radio telemetry with these mice, and you can see again that these re mice really are um, hyperactive. Well, around this time, um, the development of NK1 receptors uh, antagonists as antidepressants was dropped. And the reason for that is pretty much the same as Cybutrin, actually. It worked in the majority of clinical trials, but not all of them. And for this company, that wasn't good enough because um, there's just too much competition out there already in the clinic. And this article describes some other reasons uh, which may have uh, explained why some of the clinical trials didn't work. They got the dose wrong in humans and, and so forth. But anyway, it's no longer an antidepressant. But we were interested in what happens if you give these mice amphetamine. Because we knew they got bizarre monoamine regulation in the brain, not much dopamine release. Um, noradrenaline is, is normal, but uh, under anesthesia, it's got the potential to be higher. Um, so, and we know amphetamine increases motor activity. So what would happen if we gave the knockout mice amphetamine? We wanted to know whether their motor activity is already at a ceiling or whether amphetamine would increase it even more. And actually what happened was, whereas amphetamine increased the activity of the wild types, as, it, as amphetamine would, when we gave it to the knockouts, they curled up in the corner of their cage with a good book. And we weren't expecting that at all. And the only situation at that time where we were aware that amphetamine has a calming effect was with ADHD. And it's a first-line treatment for ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And the only other thing we knew about ADHD was that methylphenidate, aca Ritalin, is also a first-line treatment. So we tried methylphenidate, and we got exactly the same sort of pattern. So um, we're beginning to think that actually we might have a mouse with ADHD rather than an antidepressed mouse. But we needed to be sure that these abnormalities were really attributed to the lack of functional NK1 receptors and not some extraneous um, factor. So we tried to emulate the lack of NK1 receptors by giving them um, an NK1 receptor antagonist to the wild types. In fact, we checked out two antagonists, two different ones, and we got the same finding. So we could turn a wild type into a hyperactive mouse by giving it an NK1 receptor antagonist. But if we co-administered amphetamine, um, it blocked that increase in motor activity. So amphetamine was preventing um, the hyperactivity uh, in these mice, uh, and that was directly attributable to the lack of functional NK1 receptors. So we're quite excited about that and boned up on um, ADHD and found that it's a terribly interesting disorder. In fact, it's the most heritable of all psychiatric disorders. Um, and there are a range of ghastly problems. It's not just a childhood disorder. About 65% of um, patients it persists in adulthood, and it's the adults really who do have major problems with um, suicide, uh, depression, suicidality, uh, drug abuse. It's sort of about 25% of patients in prisons um, are, are actually should have been diagnosed as ADHD, uh, possibly because being um, inattentive and, um, in, uh, and, and impulsive is not a good combination if you're, you know, if you're a driver or so forth. But anyway, the, the 
problems highlighted in red are the ones that I actually want to highlight um, next. There is a very um, strong association between ADHD and alcoholism. About 40% end up as serious alcoholics. Now, a colleague of ours at UCL, Hugh Gerling, who sadly died in 2013, was a pioneer in psychiatric genetics. And he had already established a strong association between alcoholism and polymorphisms of the TAC-R1 gene. Now, the tachykinin receptor gene is the human equivalent of the NK1, the neurokinin, a substance P preferring receptor gene in rodents. The nomenclature is a mess, um, but anyway, they're the same gene. Um, and given um, the, uh, the association between ADHD and alcoholism, alcoholism and human equivalent of the NK1 receptor gene, we persuaded Hugh to see whether he could find ADHD patients with polymorphism of uh, that same gene. Now, um, he wasn't um, a, a, a researcher on ADHD, but fortunately, he had lots of colleagues who were, and he persuaded them to uh, share their DNA. Anita Thapar in Cambridge and Phil Ashton in Institute of Psychiatry. So they pulled all their resources, and sure enough, they found what Hugh des described as the strongest um, um, SNP markers for polymorphisms in the TACA1 NK1R gene that he'd ever seen. Um, and that sh uh, poly uh, association showed up on haplotype analysis as well. And this has now been confirmed in subsequent studies. So we have hyperactive mice. We've got a gene that, which suggests that uh, we're really onto something. But there are three diagnostic criteria for ADHD, and we only have hyperactivity. The others are inattentiveness and impulsivity. And the combination of those problems d defines um, what subgroup of ADHD patients um, they are in. So we set up a study to look at these animals' cognitive function. And this, uh, we use the five-choice serial reaction time task um, in which animals are in a chamber and they have to scan the back wall where there are five holes in the wall. And at random, at variable intervals, a light will shine up against above one of the holes, signalling that the animal should nose poke in the hole, where it intercepts an infrared beam, and that can be scored um, online. Um, now, it takes rats a long time to learn how to do this, and with mice, it takes about five months. You know, this is only the sort of work an academic would do. It's not high-throughput screening. Um, <laughs> But anyway, um, some of these um, mice, uh, sometimes they can't keep their minds on the job and they miss the light or they forget to respond. And those are called emissions, which is recognised as an index of inattentiveness. Other mice know they shouldn't nose poke but can't stop themselves. Um, and that's um, a sort of premature response, an index of motor impulsivity. In rats, generally... This procedure can be used to measure accuracy, um, but in mice that's more difficult because mice are really careful. When they've, when they've learnt the task, they are nearly 100% accurate. It's very difficult to trip them up on accuracy. By comparison, rats take their chances. They're, they're quite sloppy. So they hover around 60 70% accuracy. So you can do decent pharmacology on that. Um, and perseveration where the animals, instead of going back to collect their reward immediately, they keep nose-poking for a while um, just to make sure they've got the right hole. Well, using this test, we found an increase in emissions, um, increase in premature responses, and also increased perseveration, which is not a diagnostic feature of ADHD, uh, but it's very common in ADHD. So we were able to tick the boxes, but there was one thing we were a bit bothered about, and that's that when these mice had come from Cambridge and, and after that, they were all inbred. The wild types and knockouts were treated as two inbred separate strains, um, which is not ideal. And we really had to check out whether there'd been any genetic drift or any other, anything else of that sort going on. 
So we had the original two um, inbred strains, which we called HOMS, and then we crossed them to produce heterozygote parents, and then from those, we produced um, homozygote progeny again, which we called HETs. And we did a head-to-head -head -head comparison of the HOMS and the HETs. Um, this is a collaborating with um, Stuart Pearson in Oxford, and sure enough, um, sure enough, the, um, b both the HOMS and the HETs were definitely hyperactive during um, their active period, which is um, our dark phase. Um, so that was a great relief. There was also something interesting going on during the end of their light phase that um, the wild types of the original colony, these wild types, were much more eager to get out of bed than all the other um, groups. Now, these mice um, are genetically identical. They all come from the, you know, the, the same animals. So the only explanation for that is an interaction between their, gen their genome and the environment. In other words, um, it's either the mother or the siblings that are responsible for that difference. Um, and that could be very important in ADHD as well, interactions with um, others in the environment. So we got a portfolio of findings on these mice, hyperactivity, impulsivity, and so on. And we know other things too. They've got raised arterial pressure and heart rate. And also the males, the male um, knockouts, are particularly vulnerable to obesity. If you give them what's called um, lab Western diet, which is equivalent to you know, feeding them McDonald's and chips all day, um, the knockouts increase their body mass immensely. And after a month, 35% of their body composition is fat. Um, and the, the females, they put on weight, but they didn't lay on um, if lard in that way. Now, the, the association between obesity and ADHD is well recognized. They've never, ever really been able to track it down. Uh, you know, to, to what's behind it? Is it genes or, or is it family or is it lifestyle? Um, and actually, it, our findings suggest it's a three-way interaction between the genome, the sex of the um, ADHD patient, and also the type of diet they're being fed. So it's not surprising if it's hard to find. But our hypothesis is that if you could, oh, if you could find humans uh, with this portfolio of problems and then you um, gene sequence them, they should, our prediction is, they would have polymorphisms in the taka one receptor genes, and then we've got a biomarker. Because we've looked at the pharmacology of these animals and we know what drugs work. Um, so um, um, amoxapine relieves their impulsivity, uh, methylphenidate relieves their perseveration. Um, so we, we've got a pharmacological profile up to match the animals. Well, given that there are only three diagnostic criteria for ADHD, and you can measure them all objectively, that really got, and yet it's terribly difficult to um, be confident or convince others that you've got a model of ADHD. And that got me thinking about depression and all the research publications that claim to have studied um, animal models of depression. And here we have the diagnostic criteria for depression in humans. And there are loads of There are lots of different um, schemes for diagnosing depression in humans. And these are the two prominent ones, DSM-5 and ICD-10. They've got a lot in common. There are some differences, but they're not major. Um, but they, they group into three main domains, psychological, somatic, and behavioral. Um, but the important point about this is that DSM-5, which is the one people use the most, patients have to express at least five of nine symptoms for at least two weeks to qualify for a diagnosis of depression. Now, I don't know any preclinical studies that can match that. Let's turn that list into something that preclinical scientists like me um, would you know, we're used to working with terms like this. And starting from the bottom up, the purple ones are things that we can measure objectively. 
I don't think there'd be any dispute about telling when an animal had got sleep disturbance, self-neglect, when it was agitated or not moving around very much, appetite disturbances, weight change, that sort of thing. I've told you that we can already, um, we can measure quite subtle differences in cognitive deficits. And I'm going to talk about anhedonia later on. But the ones in black, I don't think we'll ever be able to measure. How can we tell when a rat or mouse is feeling suicidal or when it's feeling guilt or feeling hopeless? I just don't think we're ever really going to be able to get there. But these are um, further, further difficulties with models of depression and depressive-like behaviour. Because scientists, I think, who realise that the models really don't stack up to being something analogous to the human condition, do describe their model as depression-like instead, as though that sort of solves the problem. But it's never actually really made clear what aspect of the diagnostic criteria for depression is actually being modelled. Um, it's plausible that the resident intruder test is, um, can, can model low self-esteem vis the subordinate mouse when it's really um, on its back, possibly. Um, and I'm going to talk about anhedonia. But um, it's lots of the models, it's not at all clear. Um, also, we have to bear in mind depression isn't a fixed phenotype that different symptoms wax and wane. Different patients have different combinations of symptoms. The symptoms have different weighting in different patients. Um, and some, do, the, some disorders can coexist. And I've already said you get ADHD comorbidity um, with um, depression. And um, so abnormalities aren't confined to specific psychiatric disorders, for instance, you get cognitive deficits in depression and schizophrenia, as well as, obviously, ADHD. So if you pick up a cognitive deficit in your animal model, um, you know, what psychiatric disorder um, is being looked at there? That's never really uh, made clear. Um, so these are models which are described these are as either models of depression or, uh, cautiously, depression-like behaviour. And there's a, a, a long lecture on just that list, but I don't worry. Um, the, the, the one I really want to draw your attention to is the olfactory bulbectomy, because this is the only one on that list which really has um, very much um, validity. Even the people who developed it, um, John Kelly and Brian Leonard at NUI Galway, saying it's good, it's not perfect, but it's, 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 it's good-ish. Um, and the reason it's good is because it has a range of abnormalities, not just behavioural, um, pharmacological, um, endocrine. For instance, these animals have raised plasma corticosteroid, which is equivalent to cortisol in humans, which is very, very commonly raised in depressed patients. There's something wrong with regulation of the adrenal um, pituitary hypothalamic axis in um, many depressed patients. Um, and the important thing about this model is that the abnormalities are prevented only after treatment with chronic um, antidepressant drugs, which makes it like the situation in, in depressed patients. Whereas all the models above this, uh, the abnormality is resolved by a single or you know, two or three um, treatments within 24 hours. That said, um, criticism of the bulbectomy is that uh, depressed patients don't have severed olfactory bulbs. I'm absolutely true. However, there is a group of depressed patients who say that they know when they're going to get a relapse of their depression. It's a bit like an, an aura for a migraine. And they know because they lose their sense of smell first. So it may well be that these animals are an extremely valuable animal model for that subgroup um, of patients who show chronic relapsing depressive disorder. I'm going to talk a bit about chronic mild stress, um, because it's often not mild at all. Now, chronic mild stress is used um, to tap into anhedonia. 
Rats and mice have very sweet tooth. They'll do anything for you for Ribena or um, carnation milk, particularly the one with um, um, caramel in it. They, they absolutely love that. Um, uh, but when the animals have had a bout of chronic mild stress, they lose that sucrose preference. And that is interpreted as being analogous to anhedonia, the inability to experience pleasure, which is a real problem in depressives. Um, so depressives, uh, it's, it's not just gustatory um, anhedonia in patients. They um, lose, uh, that, you know, socialising isn't rewarding. They don't find work rewarding. Nothing is rewarding anymore. Um, nevertheless, it's, it's plausibly anhedonia um, in these animals. And the, when developed in the UK by Paul Wilner and as used um, under the EU directive, all the stresses are uh, arg arg arguably mild. You know, they're not physically um, causing any discomfort. They're more like the sort of daily hassles which can tip a depressive over the edge. The, you know, the washing machine breaking down, pranging the car on the way to work. Um, you know, life just not going very well. Um, you don't actually have to have any physical trauma um, for it absolutely to tip you into a depressive episode. Um, and that's how you use But you have to be a really accomplished behavioural scientist uh, to achieve the anhedonia with this. Um, you know, I can name the experts in the UK who can get it to work. It's not, it's not for the faint-hearted and inexperienced. And, but... Actually, because it's difficult, one of the things which is happening is that people um, outside the EU directive are actually um, increasing the stress intensity to get their um, loss of sucrose preference. And here is an example of just two papers which have been published in leading journals, European journals, in the last two years, um, and their chronic unpredictable mild stress protocol. And I think you'll agree that in many cases, the stresses, individual stresses, aren't mild at all. I mean, look, for instance, food and water deprivation for 24 hours, and then swimming in hot water and swimming in cold water. Um, and in this one, they have two stresses every day, for, which, again, are, are, I think we would call some of these severe. So these stresses really aren't relevant to the sort of human experience um, of, which, which triggers uh, depressive episodes and um, you know, I would argue is more relevant to um, the sort of experience than what's called um, enhanced interrogation techniques which are regarded as ethically unacceptable in humans. Um, and next up the forced swim test which I have to mention uh, because there's been a very very strong campaign up to get this banned on the basis that it's regarded as a severe stress. But on that basis, I would remind you of that earlier finding where it's about equivalent to a rat going out to find food on a December um, evening. Now, there are lots of things about the four swim test uh, which raise questions about it being a model of depression or even depression-like behaviour. Um, points to consider are that depression is a multifactorial chronic relapsing disorder and these rats and mice are absolutely fine when they go back into their cage and they've dried off. Um, the process is called behave, or the, the abnormal behaviour, the immobility, is called behavioural despair. And that sounds like depression, doesn't it? Um, uh, but there's a lot of debate about whether behavioural despair has got anything to do with depression or whether it's absolutely a passive coping mechanism. Uh, de Klote in uh, the Netherlands believes the immobility is a means of dealing with the stress of the swim, um, not um, caving into it. And that fits with research done by um, Bill Keating many years ago at Queen Mary. He was a physiologist uh, looking at stream physiology, you know, diving and mountaineering and that sort of thing. And he did research on cold water immersion. Um, and his advice was, if you do fall off a boat into the North Sea, don't swim, because your survival time goes down. You become hypothermic much more quickly. 
So um, if you fall into the water, float and hope someone comes to rescue you. Now, it may be that rats and mice know that innately. Um, who knows? Um, what really pulls the carpet out from under the feet of the ant is that this procedure is sometimes used to model anxiety, not depression. They're completely separate disorders. And as I've mentioned before, you need chronic administration of antidepressants to treat um, patients, but the immobility in this test is resolved by acute or subacute treatment. So this is absolutely nothing about this test is like a model of depression. So where did the idea of depression come from? Well, it's in the author's um, original papers. Here are some quotes from their early papers. We suggested state of despair resembling depression, that the immobile behaviour may reflect a state of lowered mood, that we hypothesised that the animals had given up hope and was given the name behavioural despair. In other words, there never was any evidence that this is behavioural despair, and that remains the case. This is not a model of depression, or at least it hasn't been validated as that, and it's very unlikely to be. However, every single antidepressant drug in the clinic prolongs the latency to immobility in the full swim test. They all do it. Here, just one example of a paper from each category of antidepressant drugs for rats and mice, um, and they all have that effect. And even a recent addition, ketamine, even ketamine does that. Now, ketamine, as you all know, I'm sure, is an anaesthetic. <clears throat> you wouldn't normally expect an anaesthetic, even sub-anaesthetic doses, to increase motor activity, but it does. So the full swim test is a very um, good... Uh, an indicator of whether or not a drug is likely to have an antidepressant effect in humans. So what we have, what the debate is really all about is a payoff between refinement and reduction. It would be lovely to use a procedure which is less stressful, but so far there aren't any which have been validated as consistently as the full swim test. Um, and if they're not as reliable then we will end up using more animals unnecessarily because we'll be end up with false positives and false negatives. And another reason is that I strongly suspect, and got reason to suspect, that the stress of the swim test is fundamental for this action of antidepressants to increase the latency to immobility. That if it was less stressful, that increase, whatever it is, antidepressants do wouldn't show up. So you need a bit of stress to see the effect of the antidepressants. So what's been going on? And this is a very, very common problem um, in my field. Um, and I've set up this absurd example um, to show you what's happening. That if all antidepressants make animals whistle the national anthem, then if animals are not whistling the national anthem, they must be depressed. Now, that's clearly nonsense. Um, even if you're a Republican, it's a clearly <laughs> nonsense. Um, but that's what's been going on in these sort of experiments. But how can you have a procedure which can find antidepressants that doesn't need an animal model of depression? And that's easy to explain. If you look on the left, this is the bridge at Warrington, which, if you remember, was flushed away in some storms several years ago. And the parents on this side of the river had a problem because they couldn't get their children to school, which is on the other side of the river. And you can call that depression. Well, they solved the problem by getting in their cars, driving up the river, and going over a different bridge, and then back down to the school. Call that antidepression. So antidepressants may not be curing depression or even targeting the cause of depression, they're simply finding a way around the problem. And that would fit with how the brain works. If we think about sleep and arousal, appetite versus satiation, pain and antinociception, they all rely on interacting neuronal networks that operate as smoothing circuits, allow smooth transitions between one state and another. And if one goes wrong, then you can get a catastrophic change in function, as in depression, 
but it can be resolved by recruiting a separate neural network. So it's quite likely that the four swim test scores anti-depression, um, and there's no need for it to be a model of depression at all. So, what would I like to see in the future? Well, um, obviously, one thing I would like people to realise is that if the results of an experiment don't work out, it's very important to follow through because you can actually end up in places which are even more interesting um, and pop even more you know, in, uh, important in a way than um, the place where you were heading originally. So always to persevere. But um, for the purposes of the animals, um, it would be really good to see steps incorporated that can help improve animal welfare um, and successful translation in these sort of models which are used routinely in psychopharmacology. Wouldn't it be good if funders, publishers, journals and referees all encouraged to ensure that the stresses that are used in laboratory are relevant to the human experience, especially in terms of their severity, and that particularly when cu cumulative harm is taken into consideration, and that severe stress is justified by the experimental objectives. So not to use a series of um, high-intensity stresses, which certainly uh, cum cause cumulatively severe stress, um, and then to assign it a label mild stress. That's, that's um, um, disingenuous. Um, it would also be lovely if animal models of multifactorial psychiatric disorders like um, depression, schizophrenia, and so forth, that the validity of a description of an animal's abnormal behavior as a model of these disorders um, should be justified, bearing in mind the diagnostic criteria that apply in humans. Now, a couple of journals have taken this on board already. Um, and I don't think they'd mind me mentioning them. One is the Journal of Psychopharmacology, and the other is the British Journal of Pharmacology. Um, there's no intention to ban anything at all. It's just we're trying to nudge authors into doing the right science and to interpreting their data um, in the right way. And it would be absolutely wonderful if other f funders and publishers and editorial boards followed suit. So thank you for listening. Thank you. thank you as well as thanking you I must thank all my um, wonderful uh, collaborators it's been such fun and so stimulating and interesting um, working with them and of course I must thank the animals as well who've helped with all this research and the background was the view from my lab at UCL <laughs> Thanks, Claire, for a wonderfully anti-depressing lecture. Um, I'm sure you'd answer a few questions if anybody has them. I know it's deterring you reaching a drink. Yes, there's one there to start with. Thanks, Claire. That's a really um, interesting <laughs> uh, a journey through your career and through uh, animal models. Of depression. I'm just curious, where are the tortoises? You promised us tortoises Indeed. and I didn't hear anything about them. It's the tortoise. The you showed tortoise? us a tortoise occasionally, you showed us some hares, yes. but I wasn't quite sure why they were there and I don't think she is either. Um, well, <laughs> they kind of, tortoise and hare is that the tortoise gets there in the end. And hare. <laughs> <laughs> I thought there was going to be actually a tortoise more than depression. <laughs> So our idea on hanging stress was, was hair. You know, very excited, Gallup Bear, but um, 20 years, 30 years later, Jane Hurst actually did the important work, and that's what counted. Okay, so we haven't got depressed tortoises in the no, 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 no. Right, come on back. <clears throat> Hi, Claire. Uh, thank you for the talk here. Um, so if the four swing test is quite predictive in uh, finding antidepressants or antidepressive action on short time scales. What can you then know about the antidepressant 
uh, circuits in the brain of humans that only become effective over longer period of times? No, well, uh, absolutely nothing. And that, that's how tell you about the acute pharmacology of these drugs, but the, the really important point is that um, you don't have to have um, a model of a disorder in order to be able to predict that a drug will end up having uh, an effect in the clinic um, in humans. So um, I, I absolutely take your point that the acute effect on the animal's behaviour isn't going to be um, very helpful in telling us what explains the therapeutic effect of antidepressants, because that has to be chronic. But it, it could tell us more about the pharmacology, the, the pharmacological targets, you know, what neuronal networks um, are important in this acute response, and then the, the, the chronic adaptive changes will follow um, after. And it may be that acute response is essential for other things we know go on um, after long treatment antidepressants like neurogenesis, synaptic remodeling, that sort of thing. It may help us find the early circuits that trigger those essential responses. But um, no, I, 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 I wouldn't say it's a model of anti-depression either. Um, but it's, um, it's, more, it, it, it's balanced towards the antidepressant side rather than depression. That's the point I was trying to get across. Hi, a bit of a lay person here. Um, I don't typically know how um, old mice live to <laughs> uh, and how old the mice that you're experimenting with. But I'm just wondering, you've obviously done the knockout and the wild type um, baseline measurements. I'm just wondering, is there a way to kind of monitor cohorts? So if um, a, a group of um, rodents become gradually more despondent over time, and that more human-like depression um, characteristic of, it might not be that we're kind of swimming around in a <laughs> in hot or cold water, but as you say, the kind of the life gets in the way. Those sorts of small problems. Is there a way of monitoring, like if depression, like more realis realistic kind of depression, can be kind of captured in rodents? And have you ever done anything like that? Um, I think I, I think I've got the grips. I'm not
uh, they didn't really believe it was true, but um, the recipe induces hypothermia in rodents and also uh, reduces motor activity. And that is still used as a model of depression. I saw one published last week as a model of depression. Depressives don't get hypothermia. Um, and also, um, it, the uh, hypothermia is only prevented by uh, noradrenaline uptake inhibitors. And there are dozens of other sorts of antidepressants now. Serotonin, the uptake inhibitors, ketamine, you know, there's a long list of them. And the only one that actually works would be the, 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 the uh, tricyclic noradrenaline uptake inhibitors. So we, we've got a, a physiological response there, which is hypothermia, which you don't find in depressed patients, which are then treated, um, and, and their motor deficit um, isn't affected by antidepressants at all. So you know, there's no way that that's, that particular model could be regarded as anything akin to a depressed patient. Um, and that sort of thing gets, you know, it gets overlooked, really. Um, but uh, it, there can still be valid screens, but you've got to make sure that this, the, the predictive screen is consistently and continually revalidated as new drugs come along. I mean, I'm keeping an eye on psilocybin, for instance, at the moment, because there's a lot of excitement about that being a potential new treatment for um, uh, depression. And the, 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 it's hardly been tested in the four suites. I want to know what it does in the four suites. <coughs> and a group of the states have found that it does actually delay um, immobility, which looks promising. Um, but you know, one paper isn't, isn't you know, one swallow doesn't make a summer. <laughs>